This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Fables, the new episodic monthly subscription from Ghostfire Gaming. Fables is an episodic monthly release that's an adventure that includes all of the maps, tokens, and everything you need to run it at your table. Each fable comprises of six linked episodes released over six months. Put them all together and you have a complete campaign. Set in the worlds of Grim Hollow, the first campaign, known as the Citadel of the Unseen Sun, takes place in the Estoian Empire, a realm of unending night. Where vampires reign supreme and people live in fear of the unending darkness. In this first fable, it's up to your characters to bring the light back into this dark world. And best of all, the final dungeon of this six-part series might have been written by a certain pair of uh, dudes who might be experts in dungeons. The first episode is coming in January of 2022, but if you sign up now, you'll get a discounted rate on your subscription. So follow the links below to get in your pre-orders now. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at the optional class features introduced for Paladins, Rangers, and Rogues in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Every class in the game got new features in this book that they can either use in place of existing options or just add into their roster. Several classes got brand new additions to their spell lists and new ways to add versatility and options for changing their class as they progress. So we're going to take a look at these three classes and try to see which one of them maybe got the best options presented and who came out on top. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So let's kick things off with the Paladin, who first and foremost got some new spells added to their spell list. I mean, only five, <laughs> so it's not a lot, but uh, there's some existing spells that were added, like Gentle Repose and Prayer of Healing, which really doesn't seem like a big deal to me. I think the most notable one is the new Spirit Shroud, which for everyone except maybe Oath of Vengeance Paladins might be a go-to self-damage dealing buff spell. Well, so, yeah, what's great with that spell is it adds 1d8 to all of your attacks. And a lot of Paladins get the option when they get their Improved Divine Smite that they're adding a, an additional d8 to their attacks. And then if you smite on top of that, it, it's really giving an option for Paladins to pile on the damage. It's a third level spell, so it doesn't come online until ninth level. But by then you do have extra attack. And as you said, it will stack with Improved Divine Smite and Divine Smite on top of it. A third level spell slot will give you a extra... 4d8 damage if you use it for a smite. So casting Spirit Shroud across two rounds of two attacks each, that's an extra 4d8 damage. So beyond that, you're getting more damage out of your spell slot than if you would just use that to smite. So you will need to gauge that carefully. Of course, Paladins are always about the bur big burst damage. So if there's something that needs to die now, getting 46 damage now, as opposed to 46 damage spread across two rounds. It's a trade-off, but of course, you can stack them all together if you want to. So if you want to blow all your spell slots and do a big hit, this will let you do it. I think it's, it's again, other paladins like the Oath of Vengeance that get Haste and Hunter's Mark might not be too excited about getting this spell, but for the paladins that don't, I think this will be a go-to. Yeah, and besides that, in terms of the spell list, I think for most paladins, it's hard to justify not using your spell slots for smites. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's nice to see extra spells, but I think for the most part, it's hard to convince a paladin to use them. Yeah, they also got Summon Celestial, which is a fifth level slot. I feel like most paladins are probably not going to use the Celestial for this because you're going to be very high level, and that Celestial is not going to stand up as well at the level of play the Paladin gets it, so you might want to use your 5th level slot for some of the other amazing Paladin spells that are more appropriate for high-level play. Also, Paladins have Warding Bond now. I didn't realize they didn't get this spell, and I think it's like, if you want that tanky sort of Paladin that can protect your allies, it's kind of nice that you actually get this spell now, because they didn't before. Also moving on with the additional class features, Paladins get a few new fighting styles to choose from. Most notably here is the Blessed Warrior, which really suits the Paladin and actually allows them to take two cantrips from the Cleric spell list. Now, this really does kind of advertise this 
new unique idea of playing a paladin who does use their spell casting mm. maybe for things other than smites um i think though if you are playing a paladin you don't need to worry so much about the attack focused spells you're probably not taking sacred flame or toll the dead because if you're going to attack you're probably still going to run in and smash with your sword but this does open up a really cool option to take things like guidance or spare the dying to be kind of those those clutch options for cantrips. There is a case to be made for the blind fighting fighting style. Again, it's campaign dependent, but there's circumstances where it might be nice. I could see a warlock paladin hexblade multi-class casting darkness on themselves and using blind fighting in a crafty way. I think outside of that specific multi-class though, probably not. Uh, the interception one, uh, we talked about this in the fighter. It, it's pretty weak to me. I would avoid this one. Yeah, it's not our favorite fighting style. Yay, the Paladins got it as an option, but I think the other two options here are more compelling. The final feature that Paladins are also getting is Harness Divine Power. This is similar to the Cleric feature. In fact, it's exactly the same in the respect that Paladins can now use their Channel Divinity to regain a spell slot instead of using the power. I think that this is actually a little bit more useful for paladins than clerics because paladins have fewer spell slots and other things they can do with those spell slots. So the, the, the notion that you can turn your channel divinity into another smite, obviously you got to do a couple exchanges there, um, is still compelling. Um, and for certain paladins, depending on, again, what your channel divinity power is, obviously as an Oath of Vengeance paladin, you're not going to do that. No, You're not no. going to do this? Yeah, I think dependent on which paladin you're playing, and uh, there are those paladins where their channel divinity is somewhat niche and doesn't come up very often. In which case, if you have nothing to do with your channel divinity, it's probably a cool idea to get a spell slot back. A feature that we've seen with a lot of class options in Tasha's is the other feature that they gain here, which is martial versatility. This is one of those versatility options where when you get an ASI or a feat increase, in your class, you can also swap out your fighting style. So if you picked a fighting style and you're not overly satisfied with the way it's playing at the table, or perhaps you've gained a new magic weapon that advertises a different fighting style, maybe you've been using two hand axes and you get a great axe as a magic weapon, you might want to switch to great weapon fighting or something like that. So the Paladin gets a couple nice things, but just like you know, here's a handful of new spells. Here's a handful of new things. I don't think that it's anything earth shattering for the Paladin. Nice stuff by all means. I'll take it. Might use it with some of my characters. But it's not really going to change the way that I play my character. But we're now going to move on to what I think is the biggest talk of the town in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything in terms of classes getting new features. And that is the Ranger. Years ago, there was the Unearthed Arcana for the Ranger Revised that a lot of people loved. And that kind of fell by the wayside and is no longer really used. But we kind of got a fully revised Ranger. This is like a class overhaul in many respects. There are so many changes here. And what's notable is that this is one of the few areas where the features that you choose replace the base class features. There are many, many, many features that were introduced in Kat Tasha's Cauldron of Everything where you don't have to choose. You get your cake and you get to eat it too. But here, the ranger features, you actually have to give up what you used to get as a ranger to take these ones instead. So let's evaluate where it's worth it and where it's not. So one of the prominent features that you got as a ranger was the natural explorer option. Uh, the Natural Explorer option gave you a lot of benefits in your favored terrain. You chose a terrain that your ranger was familiar with, and they were better at navigating and hunting and foraging within that sort of terrain. Uh, now, you replace that with the Deft Explorer ability. With this feature, you trade the specific benefits from a very specific terrain for more broadly applicable options that benefit you all the time. The first thing that you're going to get with this feature is Canny, which gives you expertise in a skill. So it doubles your proficiency bonus in a skill that you already have, and you learn two extra new languages. This is a really important trade-off because one of the features of favored terrain is that it doubles your proficiency bonus for 
intelligence and wisdom skills that you're proficient in when you're in your favorite terrain. So if you keep Natural Explorer, you could potentially get a double to perception, investigation, nature, survival. So four skills, but only within a forest or the Underdark or a mountain versus being able to choose expertise in any one skill. So you could say, I just want to have expertise in perception all the time. Or you could have expertise in stealth. Yeah, and I think it's really important to note that it is unlikely, and not impossible, but unlikely that your ranger is proficient in all four of those skills. Yeah, I don't think, and it's very, very narrow because you have to, with Natural Explorer, you have to be proficient in the skill already to have your proficiency bonus doubled by that original feature. So our rangers, you know, most rangers I think are taking acrobatics, athletics, and stealth already, which is using up over half their skills. So maybe they'll have perception and survival. So do you want to have doubled perception and survival in a specific terrain? Or do you want to have doubled perception all the time? Yeah, and the features don't really stop there. As you level up, you're going to gain more features with this ability. At 6th level, you're going to gain Roving. Now your speed increases by 5 feet, but I think more importantly, you gain a climbing and swimming speed equal to your walking speed. Quick caveat, doesn't give you the ability to breathe underwater, and it doesn't give you the ability to spider climb. So you still need to use your hands and feet to climb. So it's not like you're going to be like standing on ceilings like a boots, boots of spider climbing. Even still, having a climbing speed and a swimming speed is awesome. Yeah, and I think there are so many cases where, you know, rangers want to be able to traverse better than other people. And having a climbing speed and a swimming speed really advertises that. And again, when we compare this to choosing a favored terrain, I think it's so important that when we're looking at these features... They're just so broadly applicable yeah. and useful in every campaign all the time. A Wood Elf Ranger with the mobile feet has a speed of 50 feet. And now has a climb speed of 50 yeah. feet and a swim speed of 50 yeah. feet. They, yeah. they can dolphin in the water. Yeah. They're, they're a it's motorboat. Pretty, they're actually pretty cool. That like Just little things in there that, that all stack up. I, I love roving and it's, it's a pretty good place to come online at level 6. Finally, at level 10, you become tireless. As an action, you can give yourself temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. You can do this a number of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus. And you also reduce your exhaustion level by one when you finish a, a short rest. Exhaustion doesn't come into play all the time, but when it does, it's yeah. debilitating. So being able to just take a little nap and be like, I'm fine, I can go again. And I mean, adding temporary hit points just on a whim is mm. not a bad thing to have. I think I would probably almost always take Deft Explorer over the original feature. Yeah, I think it's even hard to sell me on Natural Explorer if I choose the Underdark and we're playing Out of the Abyss. Maybe I would pick yeah. it, but like, it's a hard sell for me to not pick Deft Explorer. Yeah, and I think, in my opinion, the Natural Explorer feature gives you benefits in overland travel situations that kind of just render those situations irrelevant. So I wouldn't mind the fact that I would be slowed by difficult terrain or that I could become lost in the wilderness because usually that's part of the adventure. I would have given one extra expertise skill. But... I mean, I'm not going to complain. Yeah. So next up we have Favored Foe. This ability is pretty neat. The original Favored Enemy feature is actually pretty narrow. You choose a creature type or two types of humanoids and you have advantage on intelligence checks related to them, and you also get advantage to tracking them. You also learn some languages. You get more favorite enemies as you level up. This feature instead, though, lets you, when you hit an enemy, mark them as your favored foe, and you deal an extra 1d4 damage to them for one minute. Now that 1d4 can only happen once per turn. It does increase also to a d6 and then to a d8, so it, it grows, but it requires your concentration at the same time. You can do this a number of times per day equal to your proficiency modifier. So on paper, this looks like, hey, guess what? We turned Hunter's Mark, the spell, into a class feature for you. 
which yeah. is what a lot of people wanted. When you look on the page, favorite enemy versus favorite foe. Favorite foe seems like the better option. We all want to deal more damage rather than can I track this creature? Yeah, kind of. Um, but the benefit here is that you can use favored foe without using a spell slot. So you don't have to use the spell slot that you would for Hunter's Mark. And more importantly, it requires no action to perform favored foe. So it's a really great way to free up your turn. No longer do you have to use a spell slot and a turn to get Hunter's Mark online. But we did a bit of math. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of situations where unless you need that spell slot and that turn to really turn the tides of battle, Hunter's Mark kind of still comes out on top. Yeah, so we just took a very baseline situation where if we've got a ranger with the two-weapon fighting style and they're using two scimitars and they attack twice on their turn, well, with the main action and their bonus action from two-weapon fighting, that ranger does 2d6 plus twice their dex mod damage. If their dex mod is plus three, which it would be at first level, you're looking at an average of 13 damage if both your attacks hit. You can then add this favored foe to that for an extra d4 points of damage, so about 15 points of damage. On the flip side, if you didn't, if you use your bonus action to cast Hunter's Mark, instead of using this new feature, and instead of making your offhand attack, on the first round, you'd make one attack that, if it hits, deals 2d6 plus your dex mod damage, or 10. So already it looks like you're behind by 5 points of damage. But on the second round, Hunter's Mark applies to both the attacks you make. Thus, both those scimitar attacks are now dealing 2d6 plus 3 damage, which adds up now <laughs> to 20 points. And the character that didn't cast Hunter's Mark but is still using this favored foe feature does another 15 damage. So after two rounds, <laughs> we're in the same place. Yeah, so at this low level, you're kind of breaking even. And it really depends on whether you want to free up the spell slot and the action economy on your first round, which could be useful. Yes, and where this could also vary, of course, is once you get extra attack... If you're not dual wielding, if you're an archer, for instance, or if you're a gloom stalker who gets to make an extra attack on the first round of combat, it might be worth figuring out, okay, is this worth it for my character? When should I cast Hunter's Mark? Because it, Hunter's Mark ultimately will do as much or more damage. And eventually, once you have extra attack, and if you're a gloom stalker and you're dual wielding, Hunter's Mark would pull ahead. The situation actually where Favored Foe works really, really well is if you are a sharpshooter crossbow expert. <laughs> because yeah. the sharpshooter crossbow expert always wants to be using their bonus action to make that extra, that, that additional attack with sharpshooter applied. So this is the one case. So ironically, the, the strong meta build gets a little bit stronger by this, but... But yeah, I think uh, to, to summarize, what we're kind of saying here is that favored foe might look like it's better than favored enemy. However... Because favored foe requires concentration. Yes. This means that it competes with not only Hunter's Mark, which as you get higher levels is actually going to perform better. But as we look at the next feature that we want to talk about for Rangers, which is their expanded spell list, keep in mind that using your concentration on favored foe becomes less and less likely of an option. So... I might still pick favored enemy for the rare cases that I can track something better or mm. use its weird, very sort of limited options. But when they do come up, they're going to be useful. But that's mostly because favored foe, I'm probably not going to be relying on. Yeah, because Ranger's got an expanded spell list and this one is filled with amazing picks. Not only do the rangers get the new summon spells that were introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, like Summon Beast and Summon Fey, but they've also got now Entangle and Searing Smite. And don't forget, they also get Aid, Revivify, and Greater Restoration. And they also get Enhanced Ability. I think these new spells are a big benefit for the ranger. In particular, what's great about the summon spells is that while they do require concentration, 
They last one hour, which means that they can very be easily cast before combat even begins. This comes back to our point that you were just mentioning before with the favored foe feature in that the summoned beast and the summoned fey deal a lot of damage and bring their own advantage on attack rolls. This makes them a very big damage boost and one that you don't have to give up any of your actions for either. So if you're gonna be concentrating on a spell and a spell that you might wanna bring across multiple combat encounters and you wanna get some extra damage and the utility of having a body on the board, Summon Beast and, Con and Summon Fey are great go-tos. Again, I, I feel like what this does is I, I give this spell list two thumbs up. Yeah. Which means that when we look back again at Favored Foe, uh, it doesn't actually have the gravity that it looks like it's going to mm. on paper. Because I would definitely rely, especially once we get Summon Fey, I actually love Summon Fey. Yeah. I, I think that that is a much better candidate for concentration than Favored Foe or even Hunter's Mark for a Ranger now. I think what's really cool here too is that as a Ranger, now you have a good, reliable, damage dealing, plus utility boost for every spell level. If your Ranger knows Hunter's Mark, Summon Beast, and Summon Fey might be overkill to have all three, but that does give you one damage boosting spell for each level of your spell slots. And that's going to be enough to carry you through it. It's always going to give you something to concentrate on. And in all cases, I think, you know, you can kind of kind of set it and forget it. As with a lot of martial classes, we're going to gain some new fighting style options. Uh, this one has a few that advertise some really cool play styles. Rangers also get the option for blind fighting, which we've talked about a few times. This has a place at the table and depending on your build and the campaign could be really cool. We also get the option for a Druidic Warrior, which I think has a really cool option here for the Quarterstaff and Shillelagh spell. Yeah. And I think that actually makes a really fun and unique style of Ranger. Yeah, and also a Ranger that's very good at Ranger spellcasting because now you can focus a lot more on your Wisdom score as opposed to your other attributes. I quite like the Druidic Warrior. I think there's a good case for it. Although the two weapon fighting and the archery fighting style are still kind of the kings of damage. Yeah. Um, the throne weapon fighting feature is another cool option. Throne weapons also need a feat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. As soon as, like, if you got a really cool throne weapon feat that could be used in the same way as, like, Crossbow Expert or Sharpshooter, I think we'd have something to take this, but there's just not enough support yet for throwing weapons. We also get a spellcasting focus. Now rangers can use a druidic spellcasting focus for their spellcasting. Um, interesting option. I didn't know we needed it, but here it is. I, I guess you would have had to take a spell component pouch prior. Right. For material components for your spells. This hasn't really ever come up in my games, and I haven't really bothered with how my rangers are casting their spells. It feels like someone patching a hole in the wall writing this in a yeah. hole that until they showed up and were like hey we're patching this hole you're like there was a hole there yeah, yeah. so uh, cool next is primal awareness which replaces the primeval awareness feature. it's less evil now uh, i guess i guess so so for those that don't know what the previous feature did you could spend a ranger spell slot to be able to detect if uh, creatures of a certain type were within one mile of you or six miles if they happen to be your favorite enemy Cool at detecting dragons in marshes. So now instead of this feature, you actually get access to a list of spells that you can cast without expending a spell slot. You get to cast each of these spells once per day. And on this list are some pretty standout options. Uh, two of my favorites are Speak with Animals and Speak with Plants, which are great for finding out information. Hmm. These spells are added to the spells that you know. They don't count against the spells that you have to take as a ranger. And you can use your spell slots to cast them normally as well. I think honestly these spells are far more robust and useful than the primeval awareness. You also get Beast Sense, Locate Creature, and Commune with Nature. All of these feel very fitting for a ranger, and being able to cast them once per day without expending a spell slot makes even the less useful ones cooler, yeah. because you just get to use them. I think this Primal Awareness in tandem with the Deft Explorer feel more rangery. 
than what the natural explorer and the primeval awareness. I absolutely yeah. agree. And as we move on to the next abilities, first of all, we get our martial versatility. Again, pretty standard thing that we're seeing in Tasha's. When you level up at certain levels, you can switch out your fighting style. And we've seen this before with many of the martial-oriented classes. But I think a really cool feature that we get a little bit later on here is the nature's veil feature which replaces hide in plain sight now hide in plain sight was kind of neat um you had to spend a minute to get it going and then you had to be completely still to get a big bonus to your stealth checks in my opinion this new feature just blows it out of the water yeah like before we knew that there was another option it was cool to spend a minute making like a ghillie suit to yeah. hide in the bushes. Now with this new feature, you get to turn invisible as a bonus action until the start of your next turn. Nowhere in this feature does it say that this is disrupted by attacking, which makes this a really cool yeah. ability. You want to get advantage on all of your attacks? You can turn invisible. You need to get out of a situation? Do you need to be the infiltrator? Th this has broadly applicable applications here. Yeah. This is... This is an incredible feature. Invisibility is useful in so many parts of D&D, &D, and being able to just do this as a bonus action, a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, mm -hmm. uh, this is incredible. I would 100% take Always this. Always take this. Yeah, yeah, this is amazing. It can be, as Kelly said, it's got defensive applications, offensive applications, exploration applications. It slices, it dices. This is the type of feature that I love, a feature that... You can use in so many creative ways, both in and out of combat. I mean, Perfect. you're going to be there. The one ranger is going to be next to you, like, attaching sticks to their thing. And then you're just like, I'm invisible. And you're going to look yeah. way cooler than that stupid ranger who didn't take this ability. So take it. Yeah, far more usable, in my opinion. And, this, and if you really wanted that big stealth check, go grab Canny so that you can get expertise in stealth. Like, I mean, when you're invisible, you're already going to be nailing your stealth checks. Yes. So... Yeah. Okay, now if we look at the ranger in this new package, I wouldn't take favorite foe, I don't think. I would rather rely on my spells like Hunter's Mark and mm -hmm. all of that, but every other ability that's given here, I would take it. Yeah. And there is a case for favorite foe as well, um, but I, I do think it's a little more niche and you need to do a bit of the math and kind of figure out what you're going to be using. But overall, this fixes the ranger. This makes the ranger so cool. For everyone that was wondering what happened to the revised ranger, here it is. <laughs> yeah, these features are great. You can turn invisible. You get spells that you can cast freely per day. You get your new elevating abilities with your Deft Explorer feature that all seem really great. I just think that if we look at this as the base class feature of the ranger now and look at some of the great subclasses that we've gotten along the way, yeah. the ranger is now pretty high on my radar for one of the most fun characters to play. The fantasy that we all wanted from the ranger is now here and it's it's totally a, an option for one of the better characters to bring to the table. Now, the other thing that was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything were revisions to the Beastmaster Ranger. We discussed these in full in our subclass tier ranking for the Ranger, which you can find by clicking up over there. Yeah, so a lot has been fixed with the Ranger. As we move on to the Rogue, uh, the Rogues get one thing and one thing only. Uh, now, it's a very good thing, but it's all that they get. Uh, rogues get steady aim. This feature, if you don't move on your turn, you can use your bonus action to gain advantage on a ranged attack. So really what this is saying is, if you're not doing anything else on your turn other than shooting at something, you can give yourself advantage, which means that you get to land sneak attack, even if your target is not in five feet of an ally or there's no other situation where you're gaining that sneak attack. It's a really great addition and really, really useful because ranged attacks, which a lot of rogues love was not as easily accessible to getting uh, your sneak attack off in certain situations. This now gives you that option. Yeah, I think if you need something to guaranteed turn on sneak attack for you, here you go. Again, it's situationally useful. There's you want to evaluate carefully. Like I think one of the really key things to note with this feature, for instance. Kelly, with your rogue Wilhelm, you have Crossbow Expert. 
So you're generally better off to shoot twice unless give, using this is going to allow you to sneak attack when you otherwise wouldn't. Yeah, and that's, that's what I try to look for is if I'm going to shoot at a target that nobody else is near but is the thing that needs to get damaged... Yeah. Uh, that's when I use steady aim. Yeah, when the beholder is floating in the air. Yeah. 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 Now, don't forget that you can't move when you use this feature. <laughs> I have forgotten this so many times. I will be like, I'm going to use steady aim. I give up my bonus action, which in my mind, I'm like, oh, I had to give up my bonus action. Now I've taken my shot. Oh, I should move. And I, I completely forget. So reminder to your dungeon master and to you players out there, uh, both of you try to remember that you're not supposed to move because apparently some players uh, who are very forgetful with their abilities uh, have a hard time with this. I wonder who the... I, you know, I am the poster child for... I can tell you all day about how abilities work, but then when you're actually playing the game, it's hard to keep track of everything, and <laughs> that's just the case with D&D. &D. Be forgiving in these instances because, yeah. yeah, there's a lot to keep track of and sometimes you're just in the game so much that you kind of forget how yeah. everything works. Especially with all these new mechanics. Yeah, so yep. try them out. But in any case, I think overall of these three, the Ranger's the clear winner. Yeah, I don't think we really need to make a contest of this. The Ranger needed the help yeah. and they got the help they needed. The Paladin really didn't. And the, the Rogue yeah. didn't as much either. Yeah, I think that you know, I, actually, I would say I would have liked to have seen more for the rogue. I, I feel like the rogue deserved a f more than what it got here. Now, do you think the rogue needed base class features revised, or do you think the rogue more needs a new look at the assassin the way the beast master got? I think there could have been a really interesting thing that wasn't done with the rogue that could have been kind of like, hey, do you want to play a strength-based rogue that gives up sneak attack to get fighting styles and extra attack? I also think that there could have been a case where we had optional features that lean more into the Mission Impossible yeah. infiltrator rogue who like has um, much more cool options for disguises and like gadgets and tools that they would use to kind of manipulate mm -hmm. things. Um, I, I think that that could be a really cool option, but we didn't get either of those. We got steady aim, give us more sneak attack. Cool, thank you. In any case, that's a look at the new features introduced for Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for the Paladin, Ranger, and Rogue. Tell us what of these features that you are taking with your characters and how you've enjoyed them at your table in the comments below. And a massive thank you to all of our patrons who help support our show. From the bottom of our hearts, what you bring to us and this community is phenomenal and we can't thank you enough. If you enjoy the work that we do on our channel, please think about joining our Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. Also, we do a live play in the worlds of Drakenheim every Tuesday night on our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can also catch up on the all the other episodes of the show right up over here. And we have plenty of more looks at the subclasses and features available to classes in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. You can find out more about that by following the playlist right up over there. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.